Hi, everybody. This is Gat Saad for The Sad Truth. Today, I have uh, another fantastic guest. Chadwick Moore is a contributing editor at The Spectator and also the author. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This is going to trigger some people. Biography on Tucker. Welcome. How are you doing, Chadwick? Hey, I'm doing very good. Glad to be with you. Likewise. Uh, of course, as many people who got to know you, I first uh, saw you on uh, well, on Tucker. And I thought, okay, this guy always seems to have a smile, always seems to be jovial. So can I include you in the happy warrior? Because people call me the happy warrior. So can you join my tribe and be part of the happy warrior club? I would be absolutely honored. And, and I've always thought of you that way too. I think it's a good club to be in. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's begin with Tucker. I, I, I must admit, I only started reading it uh Last night, uh, I'm maybe 30, 40 pages into it. Many of the stories that you mentioned, I, I think I was already familiar with, but it's a, it's such a good read, such a fun read. I often read other types of nonfiction. So this was kind of a, a nice departure. What led you to write the book? And just let's take it from there and drill down. Sure. I um, uh, Well, you know, my publisher reached out to me and said, uh, you know, as you said, I was a regular on Tucker's show for basically the entire run of the show, even on the last episode of the show, which course no one knew it was going to be the last episode and uh my publisher reached out and and said uh you know we want to do a book on tucker carlson we think he's the most important voice in in american politics one of the most important voices and and we want you to write it and you know of course i was very you know honored and flattered i wasn't sure if tucker would be on board with it um you know i also knew that uh i hadn't really had a personal relationship with him aside from being on the show and you know, occasionally texting, which which he initiated. Um, and uh, but I knew that firstly, there's not a lot of cable TV news hosts. I think you really want to read a biography about. There's certainly not many that or any that I would want to write. You mean about. not not Rachel Maddow? Yeah, well, you know, she might she might. Be an exception, because I think she is, you know, politics aside, if you're just looking at the human angle, she got, probably does have a little more substance. Um, and I've got, I've got some actually, and I'm talking about human substance, not intellectual substance, obviously. Uh, but um, uh, I actually have a story about her in the book and I have Tucker talking about her a lot because she got her start by a Tucker. He gave her her, her leg into television. Um, but uh, I, um, yeah, I didn't think that, that, you know, there's many people, you know, so much of cable news is is so much artifice and all these sort of, you know, nipped and tucked script readers who, you know, and, and you'd be, and you, when you're around television people a lot, which I never wanted to be. I was kind of thrown into that world of being a talking head. Um, and, you know, uh, but when you're in that world, you kind of realize there's not a lot of, <laughs> not speaking of everyone, but there's not a lot of depth. But I knew that Tucker was um, an interesting guy. And I could even just tell that he was, uh, there was a lot to him and there's a lot to his story. Uh, and I knew he'd be, you know, just a, a fascinating character study, not only who he is, but as someone who's at sort of a, a, the center of a political moment and who gets, uh, so uh, roundly mischaracterized, um, both on the left and the right, uh, as many things, you know, and the left obviously is, you know, some sort of demonic Nazi force of pure evil. And uh, on the right is someone who's, you know, I guess on the establishment right is someone who's, um, you know, a reckless conspiracy theorist and an a-hole and whatever. And then also people who kind of look at him as, you know, God, uh, which he certainly doesn't see himself as. Um, so I, I, I wanted to, um, get in and just kind of, you know, tell the human story of him and, and kind of write a book about not only, you know, the, the, the political moment, but also, you know, the man who's at the center of it and, uh, you know, what he, what he's really like off camera, who he is as a dude, what he really believes in, what it's like to just, you know, sit around in the morning and around his kitchen table and drink coffee with him and, and, um, get to know his family and whatnot. Uh, so that's that's sort of how it came about. Um, you know, I immediately jumped on it. And um, uh, as I said, I wasn't sure if Tucker would really be into it. And I, I I called him up, which was the first time I'd spoken to him on the phone. I, I texted him and said, I have a question for you. Are you available? And we talked on the phone for like 45 minutes. And he had me laughing so hard. He was packing up his home in Florida to go back to Maine for the summer. And, uh, and then when I finally got around to my question, <laughs> which was about the book, uh, he he sort of hem and hawed. And he's like, well, I don't really, I've never really read anything about myself. I don't like that sort of attention. And I said, I understand that's, um, you know, I get it. No problem. Thanks anyway. And then he kind of stopped me and said, well, you know, you're a really good writer. And I remember this column you wrote and this other column. I didn't, I didn't know he read myself. And, um, and then he just sort of talked himself into it and was like, yeah, let's do it. Why not come and hang out? Let me know when you want to do it, uh, et cetera. So 
that was um early 2022 uh, when we started and um that's sort of the, the the long answer to your question so what what was the pro by, by the way as you're moving there is some kind of noise that's happening maybe it's the microphone oh. so just just be oh, mindful of that because it's causing a bit of uh, noise uh what's what was the process of how you so so for example when i only i've only written non-fiction books but in in my case you know my process is one where you know it's based on how i reference things as a professor right so every statement that i make that needs backing up is 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 followed by the appropriate reference but the process of you writing a biography is different how, how does it work how do you start the process tell me about your childhood how does it, how does it work yeah, um, great question. And so I, I bounce around a lot when I talk. I'm like a cartoon character, so that's probably hitting something. But um, so uh, I uh, well, see, you, you know, um, unlike your field, which you know I have the utmost respect for, you know, I come from a totally different tradition of. I don't even I don't even come from the political world. I come from magazines and newspapers and human interest writing, features writing, profiles. That's always where I was until about 2016, 2017. When I was kind of thrown into the political sphere, uh, so for me, I mean, firstly, it was um, it was wonderful to get back to that uh, instead of just you know, you know, firing off some you know piece making fun of Mayor Pete or whatever, and just you know, kind of cheap shots and political shots and whatever, uh, which is enjoyable and, and fun and I like doing as well. But this was nice because it's it's more in the vein of what I really love and why I got into writing and journalism, uh, and that is just you know, you know telling a story uh, with Tucker. Uh, you know, I want to make sure I, I was in the several times I hung out with them and spent a lot of time with them over the last year. Um, you know, there's so much already about him that's out there. So you can, you know, you can, you know, there's so much been written about him. There's so much he's written himself. So I want to make sure I read everything he's ever written. I was really up to date on everything publicly available. And of course, I could check with him and follow up and dig deeper into what's out there. But, you know, mainly um, it didn't really start with, you know, tell me your childhood. I think it was mainly... Um, you know, let me just hang out and follow you around and observe and, you know, kind of pipe in if I want to and, and you know, have a recorder going, you know, for thousands of hours, uh, you know, every second I'm with them, just be recording every moment. And, uh, you know, whether you're like in the car driving somewhere, sitting down to eat or he's, you know, doing his live show and I'm sitting there and I'm getting all the little things in between breaks that he's saying to his staff and whatnot. Um, for me, that's kind of, I think, the heart of something like that, because in the moment you can take notes and things are going through your mind and you're observing and you're having thoughts about what someone's really like and what motivates someone and, and certain things stand out to you. And then of course you have moments where you sit down officially and you start kind of going through your list of questions. So what about when this happened? Tell me more about this controversy. Was this thing about your childhood true? More, can you expand on that more? Um, so with Tucker, it's, it's, it was easier in that respect because you don't have to, you know, sit down and do the like, so where did you go to college and that sort of thing. Right. Um, it was more, I think, capturing, and I think that the soul of the book is sort of capturing that, um, you know, those 23 hours a day when he's not on camera and what his world is like and what's happening. Uh, and so that, in that respect, the the writing process was a lot of just showing up and observing and hanging out and then kind of picking through it all. You know, that was, I think, the better part rather than sitting down and, and asking the, the, you know, very direct questions. And of course, there's tons of that, you know, there's lots of things you have to- How long did the whole process take from, from the first time you hung out with him with the purpose of writing the book till submitting your first draft, how long did that take? Uh, it was a little under a year, which seemed insane. Um, <laughs> I think conservative publishing is different because I come from the world of liberal publishing. Uh, uh, you know, back when back when it was okay to be a contrarian in in liberal publishing, and then they all you know they kick you out. Uh, they kicked you out after 2016 for some reason. Something happened that year. <laughs> um, but conservative publishing, liberal publishing is so is so. Um, you know, they'll have like a like a 10 person editorial meeting on where a comma goes. You know what I mean? And it's like, here's your advance to your book. Just get it to us in the next decade if you can. You know, uh, right. conservative publishing is like we need it in a week. Can you have us, you know, 60,000 words or whatever? So I had um, under a year, a little under a year to to write this. Um, and uh, there's plenty of work to do that didn't involve hanging out with Tucker, obviously. Uh, so I kind of tr I try to maximize the time that I had with him. And I try to be like super respectful of his time, even though he was you know so open to me anything i wanted anytime i wanted to come and hang out so i spent a couple of weeks you know just staying in his home being physically with him and then um and then the rest was just a lot of you know phone calls and just lots of background of course you have to there's 
so many people outside people you can talk to you know i spent time with his father and um and also you know college roommates people like that getting to know those people which is all very much a part of his story today how about his nuclear family did you spend time with his wife his children yeah his wife susie definitely she's wonderful she's really great um and she's obviously so important to him you know they met um in high school and they've been together ever since since wow. sophomore year of high school yeah they got married um right after college both of them didn't graduate and they eloped and got married um Susie's parents uh, uh did not like Tucker they disapproved and uh, for what reason he was um you know he was a bad kid in high school right. um he was you know always not not you know getting into legal trouble but he was um he was always um you know ruffling feathers and upsetting teachers and staff and he and and rallying students to his cause and on the debate team and challenging teachers to debate and humiliating them in front of you know the school uh and he just sort of had that reputation not a great student bad grades um and you know always more interested in other things than actually attending school so uh, attending class uh and uh, uh so the parents, you know, demanded that she end that relationship when they left for college. Uh, and she pretended they had, but of course they hadn't. And they remained together. Um, and then uh, and then she surprised them. She, to, she took his, her mom out to Chili's to say, you know, I'm marrying Tucker Carlson. She had to say his full name because she thought that that um, they would have forgotten who t just Tucker was. Um, so I got to know Susie really well. She's awesome. Um, the kids, I, 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 I know about them. There's some things about them in the book, but I didn't want to talk to them out of respect. Uh, and, and I, I know Tucker's super protective of his children. People try to come for them before. Uh, and, you know, we talk about fatherhood. I thought it was more important to get Tucker to talk about fatherhood, uh, and to talk to Tucker's father about how he raised Tucker and his brother, um, than bring the children into it. He's really protective of their privacy um and you know and they they suffer of course for who their father is they they suffer greatly and there's some of that in the book have uh have the uh have Susie's parents come around to thinking that she made a good uh, spousal choice oh absolutely yeah they they watch uh uh his show every night um her mother texts him during commercial breaks along with <laughs> you know half of America because everyone has a that's number. like Jesse Waters yeah yeah right yeah so she'll like yeah she's she, yeah so they they they're a very close family and and it didn't take long for them to to uh approve of the of the union well you know i uh i just tell you a, f a few of my own uh personal stories uh with tucker i i've not been on his show as often as you have not even close i think i've been maybe two or three times on his tv show and then i did the long form you know one hour show in florida where I really got to know him because that was the the first and only time that we've met, uh, you know, in person. And I had gone uh, to, to do the show. Uh, I brought my my entire family, my my wife and kids, and so uh, they got a chance to to meet him. And I think one of the ways by which you you measure the quality of a person, if you have a astute eye, is how how do they interact with your children? How do they interact with your wife? Are they all showmanship and they're always on? And he was so lovely, humane, and you know, attentive to them and engaging them. I mean, within the confines of our schedule, but you know, I so however much positive affinity and affection I had towards him increased exponentially as a result of seeing those little snippets. But now comes the the ugly part, not not from Tucker, but from my own family, not my nuclear family. You, you'll see in a second. So immediately after I had gone on the show, I put out a tweet. Uh, which was very, you know, positive. Uh, hey, Tucker, thank you so much for having me on. It was such a lovely, lovely to meet you. You were such a wonderful host, blah, blah, blah. I receive a reply from a cousin of mine. Now, let me give the context here. I, by the way, this is this story is in this book, my latest book on happiness. And the end result of that story is that the life lesson is don't live your life like my cousin. <laughs> and basically he kind of publicly chastised me he, i mean the exact tweet you you know it's, it's referenced but i'm paraphrasing something like really have you no shame and so like meaning that how could you not not only associate with a monster like tucker you're actually being complimentary towards him i mean where's your sense of shame now why is the story so powerful number one it's powerful in that it's quite incredible that a family member would do that publicly, but it's even more tragic than that. 
that cousin was my closest friend. We were inseparable growing up in Lebanon. But there's even more to that story. We went through the Lebanese civil war together. There are periods where he had been stuck at my home because he had come to visit me. And then the fighting, the street to street fighting was so severe that he would be stuck at my house for several days. So we went through traumatic childhood experiences that should have us bonded for life, if ever anything could bond two people. And yet apparently my affection for Tucker was sufficient to break that bond. Isn't that incredible? It's it's so amazing because because you've met him, you you've spent off camera time with him, and like you see like what a I mean kind of a fundamentally good dude he is. Yeah. And then if you if any of these people actually just sat and watched the program, his old Fox program for you know the full hour, they would probably be very um, conflicted and confused about why they hate him so much. Uh, you know, it's but he is you know he's certainly a media <laughs> sort of public enemy number one in that respect. It's so funny, my my um. I mean, I don't like talking about my family, but uh, but I will. Um, my my mom, I, you know, we're very close, but my mom's like a big Democrat, you know, always has been. Um, but thankfully, she's like a Southern Democrat. She's not like a New England college professor who probably would have disowned me a long time ago. So you know, she's got a she's got a soul, and I kind of understand, you know, the party that they um, affiliate with no longer exists. It's sort of the you know the kind of party of JFK, but they can't really admit that that party doesn't exist anymore because they're they're much older. But um. But even she, uh, after she read the book, just the other day, she finally read the book and texted me and she said something along the lines of, well, well, you know, I have a lot more respect for Tucker now. And I said, oh, really? Why is that? She said, well, I just, you know, I just don't understand a lot of things about him. And uh, I just, I'm a lot softer on him now. I thought, well, that's really interesting. If someone like her who watches MSNBC all day long could think that. Um, but I thought that's what was important to to set out to do. I mean, someone like your cousin, I'm sorry to hear that story, but of course it's not surprising. Um, it's, it, you know, they, he just fulfills such a role of, uh, of, you know, a target for their, their hatred and animosity when really there's plenty of other people in the media probably who deserve it more than he does. <laughs> do you feel that in your interactions with him in, in, in the pursuit of writing the book, do you feel that he's ever... Uh, uh, not, not triggered, but angered or upset or hurt by the animosity. I mean, we're all human and as much as we might be honey badgers, it somehow breaks through our thick skin. Does it in his case or is he completely, he, you know, he's so used to it that it just rolls off like the water off a duck's uh, feathers? Uh, I think today it certainly rolls off like water. Um uh, it's, um, well, they have, they, he doesn't like follow any of it. So they don't own a television in either of their homes. And, uh, you know, they don't watch TV. His wife's never seen the show. She'll read his, I think one, one time she saw the show, she sat, she sat in and watched it, but she reads his monologues every, every day before he sends them into the producers and gives him, you know, so she knows everything that's going on. And of course they hear chatter, but, um, you know, they were rolling their house, no Googling dad. Um, so they try to protect themselves, not only from the hatred, but protect themselves from all the praise too, from, from people who are hardcore Tucker fans. Uh, and I think that that's one of the reasons why he is so unique, I guess, personality wise, and maybe you can even say spiritually wise in, um, in, in that role of like TV news anchor, like cable TV news anchor, because a lot of these people are just obsessive megalomaniacs. And if you tweet one thing about them, that's slightly, slightly critical you know you get a text message in five seconds like what did you mean by this you know these people are absolute narcissists he realized really early on uh and he had a lot of mentors including his father who was also in television um who sort of told him as as his star was starting to rise to not believe the hype about yourself uh don't believe the bs because uh every job in television is a temporary job as he's found out for the third time now in cable news <laughs> And uh, you're so, you're so replaceable. You have no idea. Um, and so, you know, don't believe all the hype. I mean, hype can be both negative and positive. Um, so I, I think he is really, you know, he certainly gets really upset and really angry and really triggered about many things. He's very passionate. But I think the 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 fake news, as we say, or any criticism of him isn't really one of them. Uh, not only does he shield himself from it, but he has um, he's very centered. Uh, you know, one of my favorite parts of the book is he uh, he has this golf cart that he drives into the studio in Florida and he cut the top off to make it a convertible golf cart. And he told me that it's because he 
needs to see the stars every night on his way home from work from the studio because it's the best way to remind himself that he is nothing, that he's nobody, that he's one of billions who've come before him, that he's a speck on a speck on a speck, and uh, that he's not God because his job title as a cable news host at the time was to be God. Like, that's <laughs> the job. I'm right. You're wrong. I'm telling you how it is. Um, but that's just one hour a day. Uh, and so uh, that attitude, and I think that's, you, you don't have to be on cable TV to, I think, uh, think that that's worthwhile attitude. And if, if you start thinking in those ways, you're probably going to be a much happier, sane person. Very cool. Uh, any, I, I, I haven't gotten to, uh, so forgive me if you've covered this in the book, but are is there a final definitive reason that has been officially given as to why he was let go at Fox? Yes, we've heard the different possibilities, but is there one now that's come out as this is the thing that broke the camel's back? Uh, there has not, well, uh, uh, yes and no. No, the no is the true answer. Um, what Fox has the closest that Fox has come uh, to saying the reason why, and I think I, I believe they told this to their good friends at the New York Times, was um, that it was over these leaked test, text messages, uh, not leaked. They came out in part of discovery in the lawsuit, uh, in which he made some. A, a, and I address this in the book and ask him about it too. That um, he. Uh, uh, made some comment about that's not how white men fight. Uh, and it was actually him trying to, uh, he was talking to one of his producers and there'd been some video of um, some people, MAGA hats beating up an Antifa gang up in or something. And, and the conversation was that, um, you know, this producer was watching this video and saying, you know, just he, he was shocked with how much it was making him want to, he was having violent thoughts about Antifa. He wanted to, you know, really get revenge on these people and Tucker was talking him down and saying, yeah, I've been there before, too. You have to remind yourself that, that these Antipas, they have families, uh, you know, they're human beings. And then he said something like, I'm watching that video with people ganging up on him. That's not how white men fight. Something like that. Uh, so it was actually a really sweet and heartwarming text message that really shows actually who Tucker was as a boss and, and as a human. But of course, they took that one line out. Um, and, uh, so Fox has said, that's the reason why, cause it was racist, which is obviously not true. That's not true in the slightest. And it's laughable. They want people to believe that. So, um, but Fox has not given, um, an official reason other than that, selling that to New York times. Uh, but you know, there were, there were several theories and we address most of them in the book, uh, about what people think happened. And then I get Tucker's opinion on what he thinks happened. And then I talked to other people who, who also shared, uh, what Tucker told me uh, and which we put a video about, which is what, uh, you know, it had, it was involved with the Dominion lawsuit. If you, if you remember that, that Dominion's obviously denied this and Fox has denied this and Dominion will send letters to people who say otherwise, but um, uh, it's uh, um, Tucker was not, he was only involved in the Dominion lawsuit. He only had his, was a part of discovery because Dominion was trying to use him uh, to show that sane people at Fox did not believe that the voting machines were rigged. And um, so, you know, a lot of lefties were like, oh, he was fired because he, you know, he he uh, defamed Dominion, but that's not at all. He was actually, he was um, uh, really taking people to task who were making those claims on his show. He was one of the few people on Fox who was, uh, but he got fired and, and no one else did. So about what, so does, does he have a definitive answer, even though it may not be the official one, as to why he thinks, does he subscribe to the Dominion? Uh, story or what is Tucker's view of why he was fired? Well, that's in my book that it was a, that he, uh, it was a condition in the uh, Dominion settlement. Uh, now again, Dominion denied this, Fox has denied this, other people told me this, uh, but that being, uh, you know, the settlement was you pay us $760 million and get rid of Tucker Carlson. Now, whether you believe that or not is up to you. One thing I was told is that the reason why Fox did settle, Fox felt they could win the lawsuit. But the reason why they settled is that Rupert Murdoch was going to have to testify. Rupert Murdoch is 197 years old, and they felt that if he were to get on the stand, he would make Joe Biden look coherent, and it would be you know very bad for not only him but the network. So they wanted to do anything to avoid him taking the stand. So they settled, and uh, in that respect, what I was told is that Fox was really uh, on a dog leash with Dominion. Dominion could make could make them do anything they wanted. Now, it's. One thing that's that's um, that's undeniable is that it was ideological. I mean, they wanted Tuck, Tucker off the air for a long time, especially in election year. 
uh, the fact that that his entire team was fired uh, a couple months after he was. They were all left to go in one fell swoop um, because they were very close. They're all ideologically on the same page with Tucker. When you work at a network like Fox, you're not hired to work for a show. You're hired to work for the network. So if your show gets taken off the air, you get moved on to another show. So this was the highest performing group of producers in all of cable news and cable news history, probably. So Fox was doing a purge of any Tucker loyalists, anyone who shared his views. They got rid of the whole team. Uh, and also the fact that they won't let him out of his contract. So he's still under contract right now. He's still getting paid by Fox News. They've been sending him cease and desist letters for what he's doing on Twitter. They've stopped because it's, a, it's not a good look for them. But um, Tucker and his team, from what I've been told, has said to Fox, look, let us out of the contract. We'll go our separate ways. You can stop paying me. Just let me be free and do my own thing. And Fox won't do it. His contract ends uh, December 2024, so one month after the next presidential election. So it appears that Fox is, uh, it was happy to fire him for if they had outside pressure or not. And now they want to do everything they can to keep him as quiet and as minuscule as possible until the next presidential elections over well I, I i read far enough in your book where you said that you know if you thought that this would destroy tucker or make him go away it has done the exact opposite his voice has been if anything amplified and i i can't remember the exact metrics but you know the first one that he put out on what was it 55 million views or whatever it was 57 million something like that so yeah. it's he's now i think on show number or episode number 40 something if i'm not mistaken if we were to add up all those impressions, it's going to be a lot higher than anything that one could have ever imagined, correct? Correct. But, you know, also, I mean, a big part of it is, sure, I mean, he has way more eyeballs on him. He has a much younger audience now than he ever could in, in cable news and more people than he ever could. Uh, and much more impact on what's happening on Twitter and and what, you know, the little people are talking about. But our leaders don't care what the little people are talking about. They don't care what's happening on Twitter. Uh, I think that one of the reasons why his show being taken off the air felt like a death for so many people. And I think what we're still seeing today is that he's at least when he was on cable, he had a you know, much smaller audience than what Twitter gets. But he had the ear of our leaders because our leaders are very, very vain people who desperately care what happens on cable news and they care what people are talking about on cable news. So when he was there smaller audience, but more powerful people were listening and were uh, afraid of him. You know, the the, Dem the left obviously hates him for all their reasons, but the, the the Republican establishment feared him. They didn't want him talking about what they were up to. Uh, you know, once again, like everyone's favorite conservatives, they all get taken down by their own side. They don't get taken down by the left as often, I don't think. So um, I think that's really the bigger point. We can say, yeah, yeah, so many more people, but our leaders don't care what people are talking about on the internet. They don't care what we think. Um, they they care what people on, on Fox are saying about them or people in the New York Times are saying about them. Uh, so in that respect, um, I don't know if it was really a win for the country. Um, you know, I think it's a win for independent media, uh, which we all like to see do better. Um, but we're still, I mean, our, our society is being reorganized in so many ways and media just being one of them. Um, I don't know. He had told me in a text, and I, I, I don't want to say anything that might violate any privacy thing, but that he was working on some sort of project. Is is any of that public? I mean, beyond, hey, I've moved my show onto Twitter. Are there moves that he's making that are public that you might feel comfortable sharing with us here? Yeah, though there is public uh, information out there. Some people reported on it about him raising money for his own uh, media ventures, several million so far, uh, which he, he's partnered up with uh, Neil Patel, who he founded The Daily Caller with. The last time he was fired from a cable news network, he started The Daily Caller because he had nothing to do and he was so bored. Uh, so he and Neil Patel, who who I uh, spoke to for the book, who's his college roommate, they started Daily Caller together. Um, they've said they've they've uh, and this is publicly out there. They partnered up to launch another media venture. Uh, what uh, uh, Tucker's Producers tell me uh, very recently is that when they're able to get this off the ground, and again, a lot of this is to, is contingent on his contract with Fox, etc. Um, it's probably going to be like a, a subscriber service, and people are going to be seeing a lot more Tucker than they ever did on Fox News. So that's what um, what I've been told about it. Yeah, I mean, I've heard something quite similar to that. Uh, you know, you mentioned in the book that you know he he kind of Tucker becomes an anchor in your day, where you know it's eight o'clock. 
and and I really that that those few sentences resonated with me because that's exactly how I would organize my evening, right? So I knew at eight o'clock Tucker was going to talk to me as if he's only talking to me. He's he's going straight to me. He'd do the monologue. I I was particularly partial to his delivery style because I happen to be someone who uses a lot of sarcasm and satire. And so does he. So I, I just found his delivery to be so refreshing, so different from the usual kind of stiff anchors. And so even though now he may be having, uh, you know, a much broader audience, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, the 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 root the routinized, you know, part of at eight o'clock I could turn on. Uh, it, I did feel that loss in my in my daily life. I still feel it. Yeah. Cause you know, you made sure dinner was ready. Like it was like a thing. Like, oh, you know, what? I want to eat dinner and watch Tucker at the same time. Uh, and that was, yeah, it was a, it was a nightly routine for millions of people. Um, I still, I still miss that. I mean, now I haven't watched Fox since April 24th, but um, I, I watch Newsmax at night. I like Newsmax a lot, but they're great, but it's also kind of something you can more have on in the background, which is not an insult to them at all. Um but uh, but with Tucker's show, like you had to sit and like pay attention and listen, you know, and you had to like catch all the jokes. Um, uh, I I hope that when they when they relaunch, he does something similar, I, you know, to bring back every night, you know, nightly show to sort of address everything that happened the day. I think that'd be really great. Um, uh, and it would be um, uh, I don't know really any people on the on, online who do that in an evening show on prime time. So it'd be interesting to see if he could pull that off in this new uh, media world that he's in. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, I, I think people are still feeling that disruption to their routine. Well, what do you think? So here I'm speaking as a, a, a psychologist uh, who, who tries to measure things. Right. So, you know, if you if if you ask me, you know, what makes Lionel Messi the greatest soccer player ever? Well, I can offer some specific, uh, you know, attributes that he possesses. He historically I mean, he's slowed down a bit now. He's 36. But he, he has an incredible acceleration. He's got the best technique. His vision of the game is simply out of this world. No one else can see some of the, the spaces that he can see. So for all sorts of reasons, you put that bundle together, it comes out very clear that Lionel Messi is just an you know, astounding soccer player. Now, of course, Tucker is very smart. He's very well-read. But, but so is Rachel Maddow, right? So there is this element of charisma, satire, delivery, the 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 crazy over the top laugh that he has, but what so what is it? Can we can we quantify that? What is what what is it about the Tucker magic that draws people to? I mean, of course we know why they hate him, but th those who love him, why? He believes what he says, yeah. and he authenticity. It, yeah, because people can smell artifice, and when someone's being fake, you know, from a mile away, you know, when someone's not being real with you, um, and. I guess it's amazing how rare that is in his job title, you know, yeah. but, you know, because we're just so used to, to, to not having that. So I think, you know, he wouldn't ever do a segment on anything if he, if he didn't believe in it. Uh, all those, all those a block monologues that he's so famous for um, that's all him. He writes all those. And that, you know, I really saw that that's very much a <laughs> for him. He's um, he comes from, you know, uh, as you said, he's really well, well read. He comes from the world of, of prints of writing and literature um, much like his father. And um, he kind of stumbled into television and just sort of happened to be like an amazing performer as well as also being a very literary guy. And even, I think any writer, even, you know, even some left-wing, you know, writer for some, some big publishing house couldn't watch his, those monologues and not, if you, if you have an ear for such things, you could, you would know that like, this guy's a writer. You would just know that this, that, you know, this wasn't some, you know, producer, some 23 year old producer just being like, the crazy left is at it again. You know, there was like a depth to it. And uh, so that's a huge part of it for sure. Uh, and that also, I think, just exposes, again, like how rare that is in that world. I, another thing, too, that maybe just adds to that is, um, and I think adds to re the reason why he's so despised, is because he's a class traitor. Uh, not only is is he trustworthy because you, you think he's telling the truth, but he's trustworthy because he comes from that world and he rejected it. Right. He, you know, he grew up in establishment Washington, you know, he, uh, up until um, Antifa attacked his home in 20, uh, 20, um, 2018. Um, it was, uh, you know, he lived on, in the same neighborhood as Dr. Fauci and Hunter Biden and, and all these people. So he knows them so well. He's been 
going to the same vacation spots as these people, belonging to the same clubs in Washington, D.C. And uh, he's got the dirt on them, if not, you know, the paper trail. He's got the the um, the the uh, dirt on their character uh, and who they really are. And uh, and he can see through it and he hates it and he, he wants to call it out. Um, and Donald Trump is similar in that respect. I mean, Donald Trump comes from the donor class and he and that's another reason why they hate him, because, um, you know, it's similar to there's that famous line uh, during the 2016 debates with Hillary Clinton. And somebody said something about, um, you know, if, if Hillary Clinton's so awful, like if you hate her so much, uh, why was she at your daughter's wedding? And Trump said, because I paid her to be there. And it was just really peeling back the curtain. Uh, and of course, it drives them insane because it's all true. We know that's how it works. And to have someone on that side who's been there tell you everything you think about these people is exactly true. And here's some more. Uh, I yeah. think that's also a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that you 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 draw the, the, the comparison with Trump because there is some it's kind of like when someone who comes from the uh, Muslim faith criticizes Islam. Now, that's the worst thing. I mean, short of a Jewish person criticizing Islam. It's really, I mean, you're already part of the believers and you dare criticize Islam. So I think you're exactly right. Tucker comes from that world and yet he rejects it. Donald Trump comes from the billionaire class and yet he rejects a lot of the stuff so that a lot, you know, the average person in, in the Midwest can, can actually feel as though Donald Trump is hearing him. That's a unique quality. And of course, also Donald Trump, for better or worse, worse is authentic which by the way is something that I talk about in, in this book, if I can engage in shameless uh, plugging, I talk about, well, in this case, I talk about existential authenticity, not so much realness in one-to-one. -one. Existential authenticity, meaning that you really need to live the life that is consistent with your internal values. And I think Tucker exemplifies that perfectly. All right, let's move on very quickly to some other projects that you may be working on. Uh, although, of course, we could keep talking, but guys, go out get this book, do it now when you finish listening to this show. What are some other projects that you're working on? How do you choose which projects to work on? Is there another book coming? Give us your whole trajectory over the next say year or so. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so itching to get started on a new book. Uh, and uh, I've got, I've got three ideas I'm thinking about. Um, it's, you know what I, one of them is a biography is. of me i'm guessing is that well you you ruined the surprise i was gonna say, i was gonna call you after this and say that um but i do want to read your book actually so i need to you need to let me know where i can buy that because I, I i do really enjoy your content i have for a really long time I, I discovered you right when i um when i when i you know uh abandoned when i when i publicly abandoned the left like in early 2016 2017 oh like the first people i came upon and i'm like who's this guy i never did because I'm just kind of like shy like that, actually. In real life. But, um, uh, no, I've, so I've known about you for a really long time. You're one of those like um, uh, early uh, uh, thinkers that I gravitated Thank towards. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, when it comes to books, um, there's a couple ideas. There's one that 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 my publisher seems to like that is really commercial uh, um, and political, and I think it would do really well. But I, I'm I'm kind of in this. I want to get. I want to be doing. I don't know. I don't know if I want to do another like biography of a political person uh, or, or even a hands-on. I think I want to get into something, some bigger things that I care about, or, or even there's one idea like that's not political at all, but it's, but it's a kind of realm of reporting that I'm, I'm. But you uh, don't want to really share what the ideas are. No, I don't want to share just yet, but I'll keep you updated. Sorry no, but I, I, I like the fact, I mean, from, from the kind of cryptic answer that you just gave uh, you, if I dare say you're seeking variety in that, you could have easily said, hey, I, I've done a good job writing a biography on an important figure. Let me look for the next important figure and kind of do the same thing, ex except that the target of the biography changes. Whereas you're saying, no, I want to move on to other uh, pastures, which again, forgive the, the plug, but in this book, I talk about in the happiness book that... Uh, you know, variety seeking is the spice of life really is operative across many domains, you know, food variety seeking, uh, intellectual variety seeking. So I talk about, I, I contextualize variety seeking in the, in the, in the, in the uh, within the ecosystem of academia, academics are usually taught to be incredibly narrow in their specialization, right? You, you are the very narrow expert on this very, very hyper specialized field. And so you keep pumping out papers within this stay in your lane approach. Whereas my entire career 
has been exactly the repudiation of that, which is I just follow, you know, wherever my heart takes me, wherever my mind takes me. I've published in medicine and in politics and in evolutionary psychology and in marketing. I don't care. I just, if the problem is interesting, let's have fun and, and, and explore it. And I also live my life professionally that way in that, you know, I was one of the early guys to have a long form podcast, certainly probably the first professor to do so, uh, because I just wasn't willing to be constrained by these are the things that professors should do. And these are the things that they shouldn't do. Uh, I use humor. I use self-deprecation. You might have seen some of my clips where I'm hiding under the desk, feigning that I am afraid of something. Uh, I engage. I, I literally take a whip and I do self-flagellation to mock the progressives. Some people would write to me and say, but doesn't that taint your kind of professorial gravitas? I say, no, P people are multifaceted creatures. If I go give a talk at Stanford, I can be very professorial, but I don't take myself so seriously, a la Tucker, that I can't also have fun and play around. So I I'm, I'm happy to hear that you are seeking uh, variety in, in your writing pursuits. Okay, if you don't want to talk about what the idea is for your book, what about some other project? What makes you say, okay, I'm going to spend the next three weeks working on this investigative piece? What, how do you decide that? Well, um, well, I kind of want to go back to what you just said, because I think that's that's wonderful. I, I, oh, please. You know, I, I think that was the best life coaching <laughs> session I could have asked for, because I think I've been needing to hear that. Because I think what one of the things, because you're right, actually, my next thought was, well, who is the next big political person that I can write a biography of? And then I had a very big name in mind and I was starting to turn the wheels. But I just thought, and as much as I appreciate this, you know, any of those people who think, and I think that they would be good for a biography, I just thought, you know, my heart's not in it. And that's one thing you learn uh, is that if you're, if I'm not excited about it, if I'm looking at it as like, well, I got to pay the rent, so I better write this book and, you know, conservatives will probably buy it. Um, which I think a lot of tons of conservative authors do. Um, and um, not all, obviously, but um, I just thought if my heart's not in it, it's going to be like the worst year of my life. I'm going to be so bored to tears. And so like, what am I really interested in right now? And what's getting me excited? And if one of those isn't political, you have this shame of, of being like, well, no one's going to buy it because I've been pigeonholed as this kind of conservative, whatever. And no one's going to buy my book if it's not political. They're going to be like, why didn't you write about X, Y, or Z, but I just think you can't care. And and I've never been someone that thought like money was, it doesn't, I think it's, it's a horrible topic, you know? So I, yeah, I think it's much more better to, um, I love what you said. Yeah. To, to embrace, to follow where your heart's leading you and, and, um, and have some diversity in, in what you're approaching and, and if people respond to it, great. And if not, whatever, you did what you wanted to do. Um, anyway, but I loved it. You said that, Thank you. um, with, with what you said with the investigative pieces, I'm not sure. I think it's the same thing. It's like, if something, I was really, I was really worried about getting into book writing at first because I've been in magazines and newspapers for so long, and a lot of that is you you dive really hard into a subject and then you publish it and then you're totally bored with it, you're totally over it, you're ready for the next thing. It's a very you know instant gratification kind of pursuit of of what you're interested in. And with a book, I'm like, how can I stay interested in one topic for this long? But then you do become, at least for me. Uh, you do it, it becomes more fascinating uh the longer you work on this, on one topic and dig into it um so with um with you know whatever article i want to write next I, I think it's just sort of if i see something or think of something that get that has the kind of sparkles to it you know you get that like ooh, like what's happening there that's interesting that could be really funny that's typically where i where, what it leads me and and you know you pitch, often you pitch an editor and they're like no, that's a dumb idea. And you're like, no, it's not. I, I swear I can do it. It's gonna be great. Just trust me. Um, and then they want something more easily to explain. But um, that's usually, that's always how it is, you know. You, you know, uh, I hope you'll appreciate the next life lesson from the book. Uh, so one of the things that I talk about in, uh, in uh, the happiness book is, you know, I argue that the two most important decisions that are either going to impart great happiness or great misery upon you is choosing the right spouse and choosing the right job or profession. And, and there's no mysterious reason why that would be the case. If I wake up in the morning next to a person that I really appreciate, that's great. I'm off to a good start. Then I go off to my job and I love my job. Then I come home at night to that bed next to that person. Well, I've pretty much cracked the mystery of being happy. And so, so to the point of how to choose the right profession, I argue in the book that there are two fundamental metrics that if you can meet those, you're well on your way to being at least occupationally happy. 
number one, I argue that uh, whatever allows you to instantiate your creative impulse by definition is going to grant you a, a direct pathway to purpose and meaning because the act of creation is is a mystical process, right? I mean, I mean, this book right here, there was a day when you opened up the laptop and there wasn't yet a single letter struck. And then a year later, there's a book that, you know, Gatsad is reading in his, in his bedroom, right? Tucker is in Gad's bed. That process is magical. It's mystical. It's metaphysical. And so I argue that you could be a chef, you could be an architect, you could be a stand-up comic, you could be an author. All of these jobs are very different, but what they share in common is the act of creation. And so that you are immersed in that world, either as an author of books or author of investigative pieces, uh, has to be the means by which you get, you know, you kind of wake up in the morning with an existential glee, correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, and I love what you said about, um, you know, uh, your, your spouse, like certainly it's, it, it's, you've got to have that. Um, and I saw that so much with Tucker. I mean, like th my God, they, they just seem so in love still to this day. And they're such an adorable couple and seem so wonderfully matched. And he's so funny about her. He has like the funniest things to say about her. Um, that just seems to be so important. Do you, so I have a question for you. Do you think that, um, especially now this day and age, do you think that you can be in that kind of relationship with someone who has opposite political views? It's tough. So that's a great question. So one of the things that I talk about uh, in dealing with uh, how to choose the right spouse is I contrast two maxims, opposites attract versus birds of a feather flock together. And I uh, demonstrate that the, the research overwhelmingly supports the birds of a feather flock together when it comes to the likelihood of a successful union over the long term. If we're talking about a short-term sexual dalliance behind the bushes, then opposites attract might be very, very nice, right? I might be a, a introverted guy and I'm sexually res reserved. Uh, you may be the exact opposite. You bring me out of my shell and we just had a great, you know, fleeting sexual moment, fine. But for long-term stability, you really want birds of a feather flock together. So now the question is flocking on which feathers? And so to your question, you really are looking for someone who shares your fundamental foundational beliefs, values, attitudes towards certain really kind of deontological things. And so, no, I, I mean, it's not impossible for a rabid progressive to be with an ultra conservative, but statistically speaking, boy, you're putting the odds against you if you don't assort on those values. Yeah, and it seems even 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 more. It seems lately, even if it, it doesn't even have to be an ultra conservative and a rabid progressive, but even a kind of center left yeah. and center right. I just don't even know if they could really make it work. You know, yeah. there's just two. It just seems to. It's just not that politics should define everything, but but in a way it does because it it describes how you fundamentally see the world. Right. I so just, I yeah. yeah. Sorry, for, finish your point. Forgive no, me. No, go ahead. No, that, that was I, I, I was going to say that, uh, you, you know, I, I talk briefly about uh, uh, political orientation and happiness and, and the happiness book. And I, I demonstrate that uh, the research overwhelmingly shows that conservatives score higher on happiness than liberals. And so then the question is why? And so I offer, I mean, a speculative explanation, but I think a reasonable one, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. So I think that when a conservative wakes up in the morning, by the by the sheer definition of the, the word, there are things that are worth conserving. So yes, the society may not be perfect, the, the one that I live in, but hey, I, I believe in family, I believe whatever. And so I wake up in the morning and say, hey, I I'm, I'm happy. I'm existentially happy. The progressive wakes up in the morning and they're existentially unhappy. We live in a transphobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, patriarchal, misogynistic. We're raping Mother Earth. So everything about the status quo is ugly. And just around the corner, if I can eradicate the current system, there'll be unicornia. And so therefore, I am existentially unhappy when I'm a progressive because I need to create a better world. Whereas the conservative says, yeah, yeah, of course we can improve things, but there is a good world world right now. W what do you think of this explanation? I, I've lived it and I absolutely agree with you. And I've lived and I've seen it firsthand. And I was uh, like 
deeply ensconced in the progressive left for all of my 20s uh, and even, <laughs> you know, into, well, until around 2016 when I started just, you know, uh, calling them out and then officially. But what what rejecting. is the, forgive me for interrupting, what is the thing, are you able, you know, there's a thing called episodic memory whereby you remember exactly where you were when something happened. You know, for example, 9-11, people typically have an episodic memory about that. Exactly where I was when I first heard about the the the, the, the planes hitting the, the buildings. Are you able to identify that episodic memory that took you from where you were in 2016 to where you are now? In terms of of of, of ideological shift or, or yeah, exactly, ideological realignment. Yes, uh, I, I, uh, there's not a 9/11 moment, but there's so I remember. Um, I could point to mm, <clears throat> let me see one like four moments leading up to yeah. that. Go for that it. That was like like hmm, what's going on? The first was 20, if you got, I'll, I'll run through them quickly. But um, sure. the first was uh, 2013, I was sent to Russia to write a story about um, gay rights in Russia because it was all over the news ahead of the 2014 Olympics that, you know, gays were being persecuted in Russia or whatever. So I did the, ma- the cover story for the magazine. I was like, same thing. I'm like, well, let me just show up and like, see what's going on, you know, go to the gay bar, like what's happening. That was the first time that I realized that the mainstream media was like totally incompetent and on the border of of being complete liars, but at least stupid at the time, because, you know, the New York Times, uh, Wash, uh, Washington Post, the New Yorker magazine, all these hollow journalistic institutions with these very, very smart people were all reporting on this. Um, but they were I was the only Western journalist at the time to actually go there, the only gay Western journalist to actually go there. And when I got there, I'm like, wow, these people are so dumb. Like, they're just so stupid. And how do they like, and I knew nothing about Russia at the time. I knew they were stupid. So that was the first like crack in the ceiling of like, wait a minute, maybe these people don't actually know, like they're not the smartest people in the world. Um, Fast forward, the next moment was I was listening to some, I don't know. I don't remember if it was Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or some surrogate, but it was like in 2016. And they were uh, early on and they were giving some speech and they're saying something about equal pay and we're going to guarantee equal pay for equal work, which is about the the wage gap yeah. myth. And I just stopped and I thought like, wait, I remember hearing that women made 70 cents on the dollar back in college in the early 2000s compared to men. Like, is that still true? Like, has nothing changed? And just like looked it up. And then I was like, whoa, like they're, wait, they're totally lying about this. Like, it, like, you, like it's the easiest thing to debunk. And I remember just being like, well, like, why if they, why, like, why are these Democrats? So I thought, um, I never, I, I didn't consider myself a Democrat, but like, I always voted for them, and and definitely believed that they were like the good guys, the you know, the smart people, and the, you know, the justice seekers. Uh, as much as I hated so many of the you know progressives around me, but um, I started thinking like, why do they have to lie about this if they're so good? And then I just, and that was like down the rabbit hole of like all the talking points. I'm like, wait, they're lying about everything. And then I, you know, later that year, I was sent to profile Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, and then I realized everything, I, like, I'd never heard a gay guy saying the things he was saying. And I'm like, I've quietly thought these things all like forever. Uh, and then, you know, the mob came after me after that story and tried to cancel me. Uh, you know, it was just like stuff like that kind of building up to where, you know, I had a breaking point um, during the inauguration when the the women women's march was out there. And I just thought it was so absolutely ridiculous. And then the moment during that, when I saw them, they had these like posters and of like women. It was like a cartoon of like a woman in a hijab, but the hijab was an American flag. And I thought, what on like what on earth? Like who are? That was my moment where I'm like, I'm done. I'm totally done. I'm not even gonna pretend anymore that I'm like these people. And then I wrote a piece for the New York Post, just sort of coming out as you know, conservative. And um, uh, and then that was the end. I, then I was lost to all my friends after that piece was fired from all my jobs, you know, et cetera. And that's when Tucker had me on. That's when I first met Tucker. That's right. It was that piece. They got, they got a hold of it. Um, that's sort of, yeah. It, so it wasn't like a one, but it was definitely like a kind of building up of like, wait but a within minute. Within a few, what? within a, sh- I mean, within a, what looks like a two year period, this whole thing happened roughly. Yeah. 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 Roughly a two year period. Yeah. But what's amazing is, and I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there's, probably some empirical validation of what I'm about to say, but certainly anecdotally, when I hear of stories of, as you mentioned, political realignment within within the individual, it always seems to go in one direction, meaning I start off as a progressive liberal when I'm young, 
And as I age, I become more conservative. I've seldom, if ever, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I've never heard of someone who starts off being conservative and then in their 40s and 50s decides, let, let's color that hair blue and you know put on the Antifa flag. Uh, First of all, is that is that also your experience that it always goes in one direction within an individual? Uh, I would say generally speaking, but it certainly has happened the, the way you described before. And um, I every time I've seen it happen um, personally, it's been it's every single time it's been a uh, like a straight white guy who is grew up conservative, always been conservative, and then the woman made him yeah. shift the other direction. Um, it's happened in my family with a, with a woman who is always uh, Republican. I love her. Uh, she's great. My aunt. But now she's very liberal. And it was her daughter that was like, you have to be a Bernie Sanders supporter. And here's why. And that was weird. But I can tell that she's still like, let me really guess. On board. The daughter went to Wellesley or Oberlin. Am I getting that right? No, because we don't come from a very wealthy family. So no, she didn't actually. I don't even know why the daughter went so crazy. I don't even think she went to college, to be honest, which is an, an anomaly in itself in the South. Uh, that someone, a woman who didn't go to college would be so liberal. Um, but but she doesn't, she's not hateful liberal because again, they're Southern. So they're they're better behaved and nicer people. Um, but uh, you're right that it seems to always go in that direction. I think publicly, the only one I can think of would be, um, who's that guy in the Young Turks? Wasn't he always conservative? Oh. What? Chunk or whatever. Yeah. Chunk Uger? Uger, yeah. Yeah, I think he. Oh, that... do, do you know this? Do you know this apparatus, which I just happened to have? Do you know what this is? No, what is that? This is well, I mean, literally, it is a toy from from my children from many years ago. But I, now it's not, I guess the the battery is not working. So I created a whole skit called the Aslan Uger Decoder Five Thousand, which <laughs> whereby you know if I open it up, it will. Oh, it, it's now it's working. Look at that. It's doing it. It's it's immortal, this thing. <laughs> and, and so the Aslan Uger Dakota 5000 became a very famous prop that I use to mock progressives. So, for example, you know, I might say, you know, who who is the most dangerous uh, person in the world? And then they'll come out uh, Tucker Carlson. Right. So but I but I have to engage the Aslan Uger Dakota 5000 to get the yes. right progressive answer. So but I didn't think that did he start off conservative and became a rabid progressive yeah but it seems like, and i don't follow him closely but I, it seems like he wasn't you know <laughs> it seems like he was kind of neo Connie, you know like maybe right. like a liz cheney yes. and then now he's just gone full yeah i don't think he was like a you know i don't think he was like an anti-war conservative or anything like that right got you okay uh last question and then of course i could keep you here for for an hour more but the wife and kids both of whom don't have school because in socialist Quebec, our uh, teachers are on strike. Uh, but anyway, and we're heading off for some Peruvian chicken, uh, which is, by the way, one of the ways that I lost a lot of weight because when you eat a lot of protein and nothing else, you mm -hmm. lose a lot of weight. So there you go. Uh, any predictions that you're willing to make about what is going to happen to our... I'm in Canada, so our Southern cousins means United States. 2024, who's going to win it, Chadwick? I don't know. Well, I've I've predicted wrongly for every single presidential election. So I'm a really terrible person to ask about this. Um, I just, I don't know. I mean, if Trump wins, I think it would be, um, it would just put so much faith. It would reinsert so much faith into my fellow American. Not that like, oh, they're all MAGA, you know, but, but so much faith that they, if he does win, it'll be for one reason. It'll be, it'll be that, um, I mean, Biden's a terrible president, but I think it'll be people looking at the situation and saying, um, this is wrong. We are going to vote against our government persecuting legally their political opponents um, and using lawfare to take down the leader of the opposition party. Um, I think, you know, the Democrats may have way overplayed their hand if Trump wins. So, you know, of course I hope he does. Um, and, uh, I don't know how much I believe these polls coming out. They they seem too good to be true for a lot for people who like Trump like I do. So um, I, I, if he does, it'll just be such a wonderful testament to the American people who might say, I really don't like this man, but what's happening is wrong and we have to reject it. And so what about Sam Harris, who says that if Trump were to win, uh, there'd be a nuclear holocaust, sex <laughs> would be outlawed, there'd be famine in the street. 
there'd be martial law. Don't you agree with Sam Harris that all those things would happen if Trump were to be inaugurated I again? Th- I haven't thought about that peanut brain in so long. Um, uh, people used to like him, didn't they, on the right? Like I used I, to like him. We, I, we, we knew I, each other. Yeah. Oh, really? Wait, so wait, are you like, did you have a falling out? Is he we like, did. friends and not anymore? Well, we, I mean, I, we weren't best of friends, but we were always, uh, you know, uh, cordial with each other. We'd communicated many times. Uh, I went on his show uh, in 2016. We had a nice conversation. And then I kind of kept quiet for the next four or five years as he went completely hysterical on Trump. But then I faced, speaking about an earlier point about authenticity, I faced an internal dilemma, which is, do I remain quiet out of the the value of you don't go after someone you know because you want to be respectful of your relationship? But then if I do that, I'm being inauthentic to the truth. I need to be able to speak up. Why is it that I'm completely irreverent on all sorts of issues and attack all sorts of people for their ideas, but yet I'm not going to attack this guy when he's being completely insane? So I started going after him, but I thought in a playful kind of jovial way and so on, where I was kind of criticizing some of his insanity. So he ended up unfollowing me, then blocking me, and I'm just a joker and so on. So I said, okay, well, the gloves are off. Let's have at it. So regrettably, there's been a bit of a falling out. Yes. Well, also back to authenticity, it's not just you being authentic. There's something that, and I don't really follow him, but I just sort of see clips and and aware of what he kind of used to be. There seems to be something fundamentally inauthentic about his TDS in that, you know, is he one of these people that's like, Oh no, uh, I had my, my, you know, I sold a bunch of books to conservatives, but that's drying up. Now I need to get back into the good graces of, of the liberal establishment. So I better go in hard on Trump and, and present myself as this very, you know, principled person, um, which could be likely, I don't know. I've never met the guy, but that's sort of how a lot of those people operate, you know, you know, slime in the media and slime into public so-called intellectuals. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I didn't want to end it on Sam Harris, but we're on it. So let's 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 wrap up that conversation. Uh, I argued in the parasitic mind that the reason why folks like Sam Harris and are, you know, the anointed progressive folks with the progressive lisp, why they hate him so much is I argued that he is he meaning Trump is an aesthetic injury to them. Right. So the idea is that, you know, I belong to the progressive Malibu, you know, ivory tower class. And therefore there's a certain way by which I should conduct myself and how I should speak. And I, I should speak with the lisp. You see my progressive lisp and because I'm, I'm intellectual, right? And here comes this brash, cantankerous, obnoxious bully who speaks like a, you know, Queens guy. If he ascends to the highest uh, echelon of our society that invalidates me. So as an ego defensive strategy, I have to hate this guy because he is an, an existential aesthetic injury. So my thinking is that that's probably the primary reason why Sam and his friends hate Trump so much. He, he, they, Trump invalidates how they've ascended to their throne. Oh, definitely. And it, it's not even uh, it's also, you know, it's the hair, it's the suits, it's the it's the gold toilet, it's the eating at McDonald's. And he knows what he's doing. Um, and 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 it also reminds me of uh, old school Al Sharpton, because old school Al yes. Sharpton with he was with his hair, that Jerry curl and his uh, speaking like a big Southern preacher. He did that to Al Sharpton's credit. I think now he's ugh, but. To his credit, then he was doing that to troll white liberals because he did not like white liberals back right. then. Now, of course, that's his bread and butter. But he was doing that to be like the blackest caricature because he knew it would make white liberals so uncomfortable. And to his credit, that was pretty cool. Um, it, Trump's sort of similar in that way. Uh, and, and and that's wonderful. And um, But also, you know, in, as you said, it's an assault on their aesthetic sensibility. It's also an assault on the sense that they own uh, the cultural aesthetic, because he became such a figure of of internet culture and among the youth, especially in 2016, and become a cultural figure that a Republican presidential candidate has not been in living memory and a youth figure, which I think is also another reason why they hate Tucker so much, because it's stealing the culture from them, because he's funnier than they are, and he's having a better time, much like it, Trump. You know, these people can't be making better content than us, where we are the avant-garde and the comedians, uh, and it's a great insult to these extremely uh, brittle 
um, spiritually vacuous people who have really nothing else to live for except for believing they are uh, in control of aesthetics and culture. Mic drop moment. No need to say any more. Guys, go <laughs> out and get Tucker by Chadwick Moore. What a delight it is to finally meet you, Chadwick. Please come back whenever your next project uh, is released. A real pleasure talking to you. Stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Likewise.